Whoever saw such a heavy oppressor of the church, so unjust a tyrant to his kingdom, and one to obstinate in almost everything evil, enjoying so great and incomparable a victory, as if everything he did had been well and honourably done. With the death of King Henry II of England, John is only one sibling's death away from inheriting the whole of the Angevin Empire, as fragile as the collection of one county and several duchies beholden to the French king are, Richard's reputation and martial prowess enabled him to rein in any rebels or disgruntled barons hoping to challenge the new king, which would be a trivial task for the now warrior king. Richard would be setting his sights and the financial resources of his empire into motion for the Third Crusade along with the King of France, while also finding a role for his brother, John, to keep him out of trouble within Richard's new realm. King Henry II had many enemies over the course of his reign and defeated all of them. Only his family were able to finally bring him down over the years. Richard would inherit such enemies, but only one rival family member to deal with, John. Yet, the most pressing issue for Richard was to restore the king's peace and bury his father. A few tales tell us that when Richard approached his father's body, blood flowed from his nose, which is interpreted as a sign of anger towards Richard from Henry's body. Or in terms of Middle Ages science, the four bodily humours were out of balance. Richard probably wasn't too bothered by this, and maybe the odd crocodile tear. Richard forgave any transgressions towards him from King Henry's most loyal men, including the famed William Marshall, who could have killed him not too long ago. By July the 20th, 1189, Richard was in Normandy, securing the title of Duke there, before meeting his liege lord and now major rival, King Philip of France. As for John, he was in Normandy for his brother's ascension. Richard's opinion of John at this point in time was indifference, seeing John as nothing more than the younger brother who was still learning the ways of the world, as John was only 20 but still had the potential to be useful, as John hadn't really developed the reputation as we know of. John swapping sides from his father to his brothers was just seeing the writing on the wall. Most nobles of the realm would do this and did. Richard would honour the agreements that his father had made for John, with lands in England and Normandy, and finally, allowing John to marry Isabella of Gloucester. John gained lucrative chunks of land, including the port of Bristol. The only inconvenience John encountered was that his lands became under an interdict by the Archbishop of Canterbury. He objected to the kinship between John and Isabella, due to them both being great-grandchildren of Henry I. John appealed against the Archbishop. He wasn't going to let a clergyman stand in his way of gaining substantial lands and revenue. John might have known the match with Isabella was designed to limit his options in marriage, yet there was no harmony in the bedroom, no children produced. So John could use these reasons when the time became convenient to annul the marriage and marry someone else. And if he wanted some loving, he already had some, as he may have had over seven illegitimate children prior to his coronation. And to add a little bit of humour, William of Newborough, a 12th century chronicler, said that for a young king to remain celibate was a greater miracle than raising someone from the dead. So while John obtained a fair amount of power, there was more to gain if Richard were to die. And going on a crusade, 
There was a good chance of that, most likely from disease. Although, as we've discovered, Richard had a terrible habit of not wearing his armour. John's position as heir was almost solid. There was only one other contender, Arthur, Duke of Brittany. And if he was to become king, wow. However, the boy was only two years old by 1189. And as we've mentioned, childhood mortality in the Middle Ages was high. So until Arthur became older, he wasn't considered a threat by John. Richard's main concern now was being crowned King of England and raising funds for the crusade. Richard and John set sail for England, with Richard arriving in Portsmouth and John landing at Dover. Their mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, had been released from her house of rest and greeted Richard on his arrival. The people of England were feeling a sense of wonder and optimism for the future, as Roger of Haldon, an eyewitness to Richard's coronation, states. And thus, the son becoming greater and greater, enlarged the good works of his father, while the bad ones he cut short. Personality-wise, Richard was very much like his father, quick to fits of anger if he didn't get his way, and in some cases, suffering from vanity, but also temperate, especially when dealing with John. King Richard's coronation began on the 3rd of September, 1189, at Westminster Abbey. Roger of Howden has given us an eyewitness account of how a 12th century coronation worked. Richard would be anointed with oil and promised to defend the people and uphold the laws and customs of the land and church. John's role here was the carrier of a ceremonial sword. After the coronation, Richard's administration entered a flurry of activity, of raising funds for the crusade, with a particular tax called the Saladin Tithe, filling the coffers quite effectively, along with the sales of titles and rights which included selling Scotland back to the King of Scots. Another aspect Richard had to fix in place was the power of his government, as his kingdom would be without its king for a number of years, and Richard needed to delegate power appropriately. One figure Richard could always trust was his mother, Eleanor. As for John, he was assisting his brother on orders to quell and make peace with the Welsh princes. John besieged Carmarthen Castle in order to bring some Welsh princes to the negotiation table. Relations between the brothers by the end of 1189 seemed at least somewhat cordial. Richard granted more lands to John, including one of the finest lordships of England, that of Wallingford. Before leaving England for Normandy, Richard left two men in charge of England, William de Mandeville, the Earl of Essex, and Hugh, Bishop of Durham. Yet the Earl of Essex died not long after his appointment and was replaced by Richard's clerk, now declared Chancellor, William Longchamp. Longchamp's conduct in his time in office was one of a tyrant, arguing with his peers and imprisoning others. Longchamp would make enemies quickly, including John. By February 1190, John was in Normandy, answering a summons from Richard. John was joined by his half-brother, Geoffrey. Richard had heard the news of his top men in government arguing and grappling for power. Richard's mind was set on removing Hugh, the Bishop of Durham, from his shared position of power with Longchamp and making John and Geoffrey swear on a Bible not to enter England for at least three years. Again, John hadn't done anything yet to earn this sudden distrust from his brother. Some sources blame Longchamp, others are undecided. 
John agreed to this demand. He wasn't in any position to refuse his brother, the king. But their mother, with a sense of reason, lessened the restriction of the oath, and John was allowed to enter England at the behest of Longchamp. The political situation in England was still tense and delicate, but to Richard's mind, he was satisfied and sidestepped the issues in favour of the crusade. And by the summer of 1190, Richard was on his way along with the French king. Although the two would travel separately and meet in various locations across Europe. While Richard was travelling, we don't have much information on what John was up to until November of 1190, when news reached John that Richard had declared Arthur his heir. Richard had done this in order to secure alliances within regions of his French territories. In the time that Richard had left for the crusade, Longchamp wasted no time in securing his position in England, trying to secure alliances and building his power base by fortifying castles he controlled, including the Tower of London. Longchamp still possessed the confidence of the king and was seeking to protect himself further by supporting Richard's choice of heir. John's reaction to these events was to build his own alliances in a coalition against Longchamp, as Longchamp's actions towards John were becoming more hostile. He had taken castles under the pretext of his authority as protector of the realm. Longchamp had even started hostilities towards William Marshall. Richard was kept in the loop with letters, but he was still busy with the crusade and recovering from a horrible illness. By the campaigning season of 1191, after another surprise surprise failed peace conference, siege warfare began at Lincoln Castle. The castle was under the control of one of John's allies and Longchamp was abusing his power by trying to obtain the castle under weak reasons. Longchamp had overestimated his military might while John was building his forces around England. Longchamp, realising that John might attack his forces while they were entrenched, retreated. By now, Richard was well aware of the troubles in England and sent Walter of Coutances to resolve the issues in Richard's government. John and Longchamp were at each other's throats with accusations against each other. Winchester was to be the place of vicious discussions in order to bring peace to England. This is where we see the famous Angevin anger, this time from John who became enraged at the suggestion he broke the oath of entering England without permission. The meeting was tense, with both John and Longchamp having troops stationed nearby in case the talks failed. Luckily for the people of England, a treaty that both sides agreed upon was drawn up and ratified, with castles being exchanged and Longchamp agreeing to support John over Arthur as heir. Yet Longchamp soon proved true the accusations of him acting as a tyrant by arresting, after a five-day siege, John's half-brother, Archbishop Geoffrey, who had returned to England, breaking his oath. Yet the arrest and treatment of Geoffrey began to eerily sound incredibly similar to the tale of Thomas Becket. As horrible as what happened to Geoffrey is, we can imagine John may have had a smirk on his face. This was a golden opportunity to oust Longchamp. John sent letters to the major political players in England to meet at the London Bridge. John was acting as a peacekeeper, but Longchamp failed to meet the assembled council and the situation began to deteriorate into conflict as one of Longchamp's knights killed one of John's. 
Longchamp lost his nerve again and fled to the Tower of London. John and his council of nobles and clergymen were here to restore the king's peace. After all, John was acting on behalf of his brother, and a letter from Richard, which was given to William Marshall and the Archbishop of Rouen, essentially stated that if his chancellor abused his position and power, then he was to be removed. John had shown enough leadership and loyalty to his brother that he managed to secure the confidence and support of a good portion of the clergy and barons of England, plus the people of London, to be proclaimed heir. But we will soon see John squander that goodwill. In one story, Longchamp was shocked at the news of being deposed and tried to escape London dressed as a woman. But as he spoke no English, he didn't get far. Yet Longchamp would not accept his disposition, and he planned to strike back. After all, he was not just the right-hand man of King Richard, but also a papal legate, meaning he had the political power of the Pope at his back. But he lacked friends in England, something he realized he needed to rectify, which, in a bizarre, bold act, he tried to befriend John, now this is when we begin to see one of the darker aspects of John's character develop. Greed. At the end of 1191, the King of France had returned from the crusade. Philip would take advantage of Richard's absence and of John's lack of political astuteness 